Hey everyone, Rick of Valor Ridge, and the purpose of today's video is to discuss why the past is going to happen in the present and why it's continually done so throughout human history. And what I think you're going to find after this video is that it has to deal with the way people view the world, how they look at the world. In other words, what is their vision for the world? And this is alluded to by Dr. Thomas Sowell in his book, A Conflict of Visions. So I've got a link to that in the description box if you want to read more on that. Uh, but use some of his ideas as well as, as some of my own observations and hopefully a lot of the stuff will make sense for you. So let's go ahead and get started. First and foremost, when I do my history videos, a lot of them are based on facts, they're based on empirical evidence, they're based on analysis of situations that have happened before, based on primary source documents, but also based on uh, critiques of others as well. Uh, this video is designed to, to spark debate, it's designed to spark discussion. Uh, very rarely am I going to make an absolute statement when it comes to history. Now firearms, I, I tend to make a lot more absolute statements on that because what works works and what doesn't doesn't. Uh, but with the history videos, I really would like to encourage some discussion, um, at least get you thinking along these these paths. Before we even dive into this, I had a professor in, in college and in, in undergraduate and graduate school. I had her for a, a number of classes and she was a great professor, uh, Dr. Paler. Uh, she was born in Germany, so she was real abrupt, very um, direct, I should say, but in a very good way. And a lot of students would raise their hands when they'd make a point and they, and, and they would raise their hand and they would say, oh, Dr. Paler, um, I feel that, and she would interrupt them. She goes, I don't give a, and I'll try to do my best impersonation of her. She goes, I don't give a rat's ass what you feel. Tell me what you think and know. So uh, that's what I always love to say when, when people say, well, I feel. Well, I don't care what you feel. Nobody cares what you feel. Say, say what you think and what you know. All right, let's get on to the material. The best historians that have had the best work take a broad view of history. They look at it as a macroscopic thing as opposed to a microscopic thing. And the tend to, in history, unfortunately, in the recent times, with especially within the last 20 or 30 years, is to view history under a microscope. In other words, look at a time frame uh, in a very short period of time, very narrow culture. They don't look broad scale. I mean, let, take some of the best works of history that there are. History of the English-speaking peoples. Winston Churchill, when he wrote that, he had vast volumes of material that he wrote on. Um, same thing with Gibbons, A Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. I mean, massive amount of time, large topic, large uh, large thesis statement, I mean just amazing work. So what I'm going to do in this one is, is I want you to think broadly. So why does the past continue to become the present? In other words, why do we see the same patterns emerge over and over and over again no matter what society or what civilization we're talking about? We see the same patterns emerge over and over again. Um, there's a couple of reasons why. The first one, why the past continues to happen in the present, why we can look to the past for wisdom, is because of human nature. Um, the most people will have one of the two, very rarely is it blended, but they'll have one of two visions of what human nature is. The first one is a constrained vision of what human nature is. In other words, human beings are what they are, so their behavior needs to be limited. There have to be laws passed, and I mean laws that are real, that protect life, liberty, and property. That's the purpose of laws. If you look or read Bastiat's The Spirit of Laws, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So human beings are going to do what they're going to do. Therefore, the purpose of government is to protect life, protect liberty, and protect property. Now, that's a constrained vision. In other words, people think human nature is fixed, and the people are going to have the same tendencies over and over again. Now, on the flip side of this coin is where you have an unconstrained vision of what human nature is. In other words, human beings are a blank slate, and if they're just put in the proper environment, and if they just have the right leaders in charge, and if they just have the right government structure, that everything will be fine. Uh, in other words, we're a blank slate, and we are, we are products of our environment. Those with a constrained vision of human nature would be like our founding fathers, people like Aristotle. They could observe people, they could observe a phenomenon and they would look and, and see repeatable things happening. In other words, empirical data, proof, proof through time, proof through repeatable, reliable things. They were empirical scholars, empiricists, if you will. Our Founding Fathers a classic example of that, especially John Adams, especially guys like Benjamin Franklin. Those guys were, at, were definitely constrained. They knew the tendencies of human beings over time and set up a system of government that would check human ambition. Now, on the flip side of this, you have unconstrained people, uh, visionaries that, that view human nature as unconstrained. In other words, 
These are people that believe human nature can be altered, it can be changed. We see this idea manifesting in many different societies. I mean, in any communist nation, you see that, that their theory on human nature is that people can just eventually learn to govern themselves. But in the meantime, we need a strict government in place in order to teach people how to do this, in order to, to slake their uh, selfishness and, and be able to learn how to be better. <clears throat> we also see this in, in the French Revolution. I mean, if you compare the French versus the American Revolution, it's insane just how different that they were. In the American Revolution, afterwards uh, the system of government was set up based on a rule of law that stayed the same you know in France you had a revolution that just changed literally every year and changed day to day they just made up the rules as they went along with the Jacobins and especially during the directory the rules changed constantly um, so we see a constrained versus unconstrained right there the second reason is because of human ambition of power. And I guess this would flow right into human nature. But when we talk about power, we're not talking about just ambition. We are talking about those mechanisms that allow that ambition to take form. For example, you can be the most ambitious individual in the world, but if you don't have a power mechanism to enact your will on others, it's useless. These are the people that sit in their apartment and rant and rave all day long with no one that's listening to them. They, they may have these, these odd ideas, but no one's gonna listen to them. Now, when we talk Talk about power. Our founders understood that, and in fact, uh, Lord Acton said that power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. He's a constrained visionary. He understood human beings would seek power, and in order to influence others, would would seek those mechanisms or put those mechanisms in place. So, what you have with the founders is the Constitution uh, of the United States is a document, is a blueprint that was designed to check government. It is a blueprint against government, if you will. In other words, there are there are very strict places government cannot go or dabble in. And of course, this is when the unconstrained visionaries, guys like Alexander Hamilton and other Supreme Court justices, that were constrained visionaries they would uh, use the general welfare clause or you know they would use these these vague terms in order to increase government power as opposed to limit it when everybody at the constitutional convention sought to limit government but this is where we start seeing the difference in worldview between the constrained and the unconstrained people and how they view things so our founders knew that power always tends to centralize and in fact Thomas Jefferson said that when all matters become centralized in Washington DC then we then our government Government will become as venal and as oppressive as the one from which we separated. I'm paraphrasing him, of course, but he knew, he understood this very clearly, that power tended to centralize. Well, the Constitution is, a, is supposed to be a decentralized plan. Uh, federalism is state governments are sovereign and the federal government is sovereign in certain things. So the Constitution explicitly divides powers up because the founders knew that a, divi a division of powers is superior to a centralization of power. So I want you to juxtapose that with the unconstrained vision that we just need to give government more power. If we just get the right people in charge, it will be okay. Uh, these are examples would be would be the Soviet Union, the Bolsheviks, you know, Lenin. Uh, if we just if we just put the if we just give the the government more power, it'll be okay. And if we just make the right people in, it'll be fine. And then you see this during Plato. You know, Plato and Aristotle disagreed with each other on many things. Plato had this theory that if you had a society based on philosopher kings with unlimited power, with unlimited power, but if you had philosopher kings that they would, they would very benevolently, if you will, they would benevolently uh, make sure everyone was provided for and taken care of. So th this is a big idea. One, one assumes that human beings are naturally corrupted and that they need to be checked. The other assumes that, oh, if we just give government more power, you saw this during the Obama presidency, you know, where you had his supporters saying, well, Congress should just get out of his way and let him do what he wants to do. Well, that may, that may work when your guy's in office, but what about when there's a tyrant in office even, even more tyrannical than that? What happens when somebody who is truly evil gets in there and uses those same powers that you gave to your feel-good savior of, of the election cycle? See, that's the problem, is that people don't think ahead and they don't think what problems can happen if you just give the executive branch absolute power. That's a problem, okay? And that's where unconstrained people would go, is that they'd say, no, 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 he's a good guy, therefore we need to give him more power so that he can get things done more efficiently. This is problematic. A third reason why the past continues to happen in the present is because people, when they get into a society that is comfortable, often get distracted very easily. Now, at the beginning of our republic, and we are a republic, folks, um, we are guaranteed a republican form of government. That's what it says in, in the Constitution. It says nothing about democracy or democratic anything. Uh, we are a republic. So, and, and, if, and by the way, all you guys out there, oh, that's not what they meant. Show me, show me one of our founding documents where democracy is mentioned even once. Just 
just once and I'll give you $10,000 because it's not gonna happen because it's not there so stop making things up. Well, here we are and we get in this society and we have a good standard of living and it's easy to get distracted and I understand that a republic is designed to elect representatives on our behalf. That is the point of the republic because we can't have every citizen involved on every issue voting on every issue. That would be time prevent, uh, it'd be very prohibitive and furthermore, nobody just has that ability to be that plugged in all the time so we elect representatives. But in that case, Benjamin Franklin said a republic if you can keep it. Well, here we are. I mean, our republic, the constitutional form of government that we have started, uh, it, you know, in full earnest when, when it was fully ratified in 1789. Here we are in 2018, and it's been well over 200 years that we've been doing this, and we've had a lot of distractions. I mean, we've got sports, we've got entertainment, we've got all kinds of things that you can imagine. Um, the problem here is that Societies become fallen when you look at these th these criteria. Pe their citizens get apathetic. Oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. My vote doesn't count. Who cares? Um, we get people that procrastinate. Oh, we'll just keep going into debt. It's okay. Let's let the government keep borrowing our money. Let's let the government keep spending our money. Uh, we see these problems and, and, and these constant warfare. You know, these are the things that, that, crumble, that cripple societies. When you're at war constantly, you're going to go further in debt, which means that you're going to procrastinate and kick the can down the road, which serves to, in, which is an absolute recipe for disaster. The other problem, the other, the other reason why societies fall uh, because of this uh, distraction becomes the issue of indifference. In other words, indifference towards other people's citizens. Oh, they're taking rights away from that group of people. That didn't affect me. That didn't affect me at all. And it's kind of related to apathy, but there's a different component to it. Apathy is you just don't care about something. Indifference means you know something's wrong. You just do nothing about it because it doesn't affect you. So I'll give you an example in the Second Amendment uh, community, and I use that word very loosely because they are a group of individuals, and if it's not their pet little gun, nobody else really gives a crap about it, which is unfortunate because that's how the 94 Clinton crime bill went into effect. All the shotgunners didn't care about the AR-15 guys. All the revolver shooters didn't care about the semi-auto guys. You know, if you look at this channel, I, like I'm, I'm directly offended uh, when anything against the Second Amendment comes into play. And in fact, have been very active in promoting uh, the Second Amendment and getting people to call to action. You know, I've, I've made the faxes to congressmen. I put links all over the place. I've called. You know, I, I've done rallies. All of these things have happened. So, uh, definitely not indifferent to the Second Amendment. But let's take that for an example. You know, on this on this latest gun control thing. Oh well. It only affects 18-year-olds. They, they're too young anyway, and they have no problem sending those 18-year-olds off to war. But it doesn't affect them because they're not 21. So who gives a crap, right? I'm, tw you know, I'm over the age of 21. I, that's fine. You're got to be 21 to drink. So then they justify these violations of civil liberties, and that's what they are, um, by, because it doesn't affect them. So, just some thoughts, just some things to sp uh, to spark thought, discussion, and figure out, you know, in the United States, you know, how many of these are present today? How many of those issues are present? And, rel and related and directly applicable to what's going on. So I hope you found this video helpful and, and thought-provoking, and I hope that you all had a great Memorial Day. And I know that I most certainly reflected on that. I'm in the, actually the middle of a class right now. It's a break. As you can see, I've got my, my instructor shirt on, but we've, we've been conducting six straight days of class, so it's going well. Uh, I wish you all the best out there. I hope that you found value from this video. Um, if you did, subscribe to the channel and follow me on Facebook. That link is down below. And if you do want to get some training, if you do want to learn how to use your pistols and rifles, come on out to Valor Ridge, and we can help you on any one of those that you'd like. This is Reed Hendricks with Valor Ridge reminding you the lessons that we learn are written on the tombstones of others. We'll see you on the ridge.